Tomorrow's events will have a complete rundown tonight. ABC's presentation of Liberty Weekend is brought to you by Kmart, the saving place. We're proud to say you've made us America's favorite store. The Stro Brewery Company, proud to be a founding sponsor of the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation. Dole Fruit and Cream Bars and Johnson & Johnson, where quality products have been a tradition for generations. You let that go off, and we, you will have an early fireworks display. <laughs> Just to give you some indication of what we can look forward to tonight, and we're looking forward to the president, by the way, to come out on the USS John F. Kennedy and talk to him. That is one of the smaller shells they are going to use this evening. I am assured by George Plimpton, the man who knows more about fireworks than anybody else in America, that this is perfectly safe. But George, I think you might take it back. Is that really one of the smaller ones of the evening? Yeah, this is a, a five-inch shell, uh, five inches in diameter up here. The largest shell of the night, and there are going to be four of them, is a Japanese shell which is 18 inches in diameter and weighs, oh heavens, 110 or 15 pounds. It'll be the first shell of the night, there'll be one in the middle of the show, and then in the finale, at the end of the finale, there'll be two more of these enormous things shot off from Liberty Island. We're going to have 40,000 projectiles, as they say, before the evening is over. Um, and the last great fireworks display in this country, I guess, George, was for the Brooklyn Bridge, 1983, April 1983. How big will this be compared to that, which was glorious? Well, I would guess it would be almost four times, between three and four times as large. That was a show that cost in the neighborhood of $200,000. This one is $700,000, $800,000 worth of preparation, fireworks, and the rest of it. The very it'll be, it'll that, be stupendous. The very fact that George is wearing a headset, I think, is some indication. <laughs> Which we will be doing shortly. There's also a rather a drama behind this, because uh, as I understand it, the manufacturers of fireworks are very competitive, competitive, and one doesn't tell the other one ever what he's doing. Tonight, for the first time, they're united for this big Yes, uh, there are three great firework families. The uh, uh, the Sousas from California, Pyro, Spectac Pyro Spectaculars, uh, the Gruchis from Bellport, Long Island, and the Zambellis from Pennsylvania have all teamed together in a sort of a triad. And firework families do not like each other at all, so that in itself is a sort of a triumph. Okay? I, re I read in your book, as a matter of fact, George, that in the old days, the wives of the families would walk up and down the firework pits with shotguns. <laughs> Let's ask you both to be quiet for just a second, and me as well, because let's go to the USS John F. Kennedy in the harbor. President Reagan is now going to come on to the deck of the USS John F. Kennedy to speak Ladies to the nation the on the subject of this 210th anniversary of independence and the 100th anniversary of the Statue of Liberty's arrival in America. The president, to the tune, ruffles and flourishes, music from the 16th century, has had a very busy day. He reviewed the International Naval Armada, and there on board the John F. Kennedy, the sailors and their officers, who, as the men in, on any ship, realize the honor of having the commander-in-chief on board. The John F. Kennedy was the largest ship in the International Naval Review here, the fifth international naval review that's been held in the United States since the early part of the 19th century. There, once again, beneath the Statue of Liberty, the President. My fellow Americans, in a few moments, the celebration will begin here in New York Harbor. It's going to be quite a show. I was just looking over the preparations and thinking about a saying that we had back in Hollywood about never doing a scene with kids or animals because they'd steal the scene every time. So you can rest assured, I wouldn't even think about trying to compete with a fireworks display, especially on the 4th of July. My remarks tonight will be brief, but it's worth remembering that all the celebration of this day is rooted in history. It's recorded that Shortly after the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia, celebrations took place throughout the land, and many of the former colonists, they were just starting to call themselves Americans, set off cannons and marched in fife and drum parades. What a contrast with the 
sober scene that has taken place a short time earlier in Independence Hall. 56 men came forward to sign the parchment. It was noted at the time that they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. And that was more than rhetoric. Each of those men knew the penalty for high treason to the crown. We must all hang together, Benjamin Franklin said, or assuredly we will all hang separately. And John Hancock, it is said, wrote his signature in large script so King George could see it without his spectacles. They were brave. They stayed brave through all the bloodshed of the coming years. Their courage created a nation built on a universal claim to human dignity, on the proposition that every man, woman, and child had a right to a future of freedom. For just a moment, let us listen to the words again. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Last night, when we read, rededicated Miss Liberty and relit her torch, we reflected on all the millions who came here in search of the dream of freedom, inaugurated in Independence Hall. We reflected, too, on their courage in coming great distances and settling in a foreign land and then passing on to their children and their children's children. The hope symbolized in this statue here just behind us. The hope that is America. It is a hope that someday every people and every nation of the world will know the blessings of liberty. And it's the hope of millions all around the world. In the last few years, I've spoken at Westminster to the Mother of Parliaments, at Versailles where French kings and world leaders have made war and peace. I've been to the Vatican in Rome, the Imperial Palace in Japan, and the ancient city of Beijing. I've seen the beaches of Normandy and stood again with those boys of Pointe de Hoc who long ago scaled the heights, and with at that time Lisa Zanetta Hen who was at Omaha Beach for the father she loved the father who had once dreamed of seeing again the place where he and so many brave others had landed on D-Day but he had died before he could make that trip and she made it for him and dad she had said I'll always be proud and I've seen the successors to these brave men the young Americans in uniform all over the world Young Americans, like you here tonight, who man the mighty USS Kennedy and the Iowa and the other ships of the line. I can assure you, you out there who are listening, that these, these young people are like their fathers and their grandfathers, just as willing, just as brave, and we can be just as proud. But our prayer tonight is that the call for their courage will never come and that it's important for us, too, to be brave. Not so much the bravery of the battlefield, I mean the bravery of brotherhood. All through our history, our presidents and leaders have spoken of national unity and warned us that the real obstacle to moving forward the boundaries of freedom, the only permanent danger to the hope that is America, comes from within. It's easy enough to dismiss this as a kind of familiar exhortation Yet the truth is that even two of our greatest founding fathers, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, once learned this lesson late in life. They'd worked so closely together in Philadelphia for independence. But once that was gained and a government was formed, something called partisan politics began to get in the way. After a bitter and divisive campaign, Jefferson defeated Adams for the presidency in 1800. And the night before Jefferson's inauguration, Adams slipped away to Boston, disappointed, brokenhearted, and bitter. For years, their estrangement lasted. But when, when both had retired, Jefferson at 68 to Monticello, and Adams at 76 to Quincy, they began through their letters to speak again to each other. Letters that discussed almost every conceivable subject, gardening, horseback riding, even sneezing as a cure for hiccups. 
but other subjects as well. The loss of loved ones, the mystery of grief and sorrow, the importance of religion, and of course, the last thoughts, the final hopes of two old men, two great patriarchs for the country that they had helped to found and loved so deeply. It carries me back, Jefferson wrote, about correspondence with his co-signer of the Declaration of Independence, to the times when, beset with difficulties and dangers, we were fellow laborers in the same cause, struggling for what is most valuable to man, his right to self-government, laboring always at the same oar, with some wave ever ahead threatening to overwhelm us and yet passing harmless, we rode through the storm with heart and hand. It was their last gift to us, this lesson in brotherhood, in tolerance for each other, this insight into America's strength as a nation. And when both died on the same day, within hours of each other, that date was July 4th, 50 years exactly after that first gift to us, the Declaration of Independence. My fellow Americans, it falls to us to keep faith with them and all the great Americans of our past. Believe me, if there's one impression I carry with me after the privilege of holding for five and a half years the office held by Adams, Jefferson, and Lincoln, it is this, that the things that unite us America's past, of which we're so proud, our hopes and aspirations for the future of the world and it, this much-loved country, these things far outweigh what little divides us. And so tonight, we reaffirm that Jew and Gentile, we are one nation under God, that black and white, we are one nation indivisible, that Republican and Democrat, we are all Americans. Tonight, with heart and hand, through whatever trial and travail, we pledge ourselves to each other and to the cause of human freedom, the cause that has given light to this land and hope to the world. My fellow Americans, we're known around the world as a confident and a happy people. Tonight, there's much to celebrate and many blessings to be grateful for. So while it's good to talk about serious things, it's just as important and just as American to have some fun. Now, let's have some fun. Let the celebration begin. A light to the world, a beacon held high. from a harbor. To the north. To the south. To the east. To the west. Reaching across the world to all whose hearts know the meaning of her life.